Amen. My dearly beloved in Christ, it would be nearly impossible for us to exaggerate the spiritual gifts of St. Joseph. In an old Greek hymn, he's addressed as more than saint. Father Signori says, no man on earth was ever holier than St. Joseph. St. Joseph was an instrument in our redemption since it was necessary, according to God's plan, that Jesus be provided for. Suarez and many other theologians hold that St. Joseph is superior to all other saints ex except our Blessed Lady herself and is also superior to the angels. Jesus is King of Angels, Mary is Queen of Angels, and yet they were both subject to St. Joseph. Thus, St. Joseph's dignity and glory comes from his marriage to the Blessed Virgin Mary. St. Thomas says that the greatest reverence is due to a man from the relationship which he has with God. The relationship between the Holy Trinity and St. Joseph lies essentially in the fact that Our Lady was subject to him because she was married to him. Jesus, as St. Joseph's foster child, was also subject to him. Both Our Lord and Our Lady consulted St. Joseph and were obedient to him as head of the Holy Family. My dear and beloved in Christ, God chose St. Joseph for his special role in order to show his great respect for family life. Christ could have come to redeem us in any way he desired, but came in a family since it's the foundation of society. The Holy Family is the example for all families, and St. Joseph, the model for all fathers. He was teacher, <clears throat> provider, advisor, guardian, protector, head, and loving ruler of the Holy Family. Jesus and Mary placed themselves under St. Joseph's fatherly control. In the, in the revelations of St. Bridget, we find Our Lady saying, My son was so obedient that when St. Joseph said, Do this or that, immediately he did it. There's an old Eastern tradition which represents our Lord as saying, I converse with St. Joseph in all things as if I had been his child. He called me son, and I called him father. And I loved him as the apple of my eye. Since God destined for St. Joseph the work of being the foster father of his son and the spouse of the mother of God, he wrought wonderful favors in St. Joseph's soul and molded it with an especial love. It follows that St. Joseph would be given especially great graces, <clears throat> graces second only to those received by the mother of God herself. It can be believed without question that St. Joseph, from the very first moment of the use of reason, gave himself to God and never committed any actual sin. For all eternity, he had pre been predestined to be the spouse of Mary and the foster father of Jesus. He was consequently predestined to the graces for that state. For St. Thomas Aquinas enunciates the principle, God gives to everyone the grace is proportionate to that for which he is chosen. All the doctors of the church agree that next to the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Joseph was the holiest and purest of creatures, second only to Mary. When God gave St. Joseph to Mary, no other man could have been found like to her. We have only to look to Mary to know what St. Joseph must have been. St. Francis de Sales says that although Mary possesses every virtue in a greater degree than any other creature, St. Joseph is the only being who comes most nearly to that perfection. In describing St. Joseph, St. Jo Justin says that in manliness, in appearance, he was most like our Lord. St. Jerome maintained that St. Joseph needed to be young and vigorous and a rugged, majestic young man. This makes sense considering his responsibility at the time of the nativity, the flight into Egypt, the manual work he had to do at Nazareth, and the protection and care he had to provide for Our Lady and the Christ Child. St. Joseph was a carpenter, which was a profession of hard labor. In his human nature, Jesus learned the trade from him. 
The Holy Family, in perfect submission to God, were content with their poverty and lot in life because it was the will of God. We, on the other hand, will often go about our daily work discontent with our lot in life for one reason or another. We grumble because we have to struggle in order to make ends meet. Instead, we should take heart from St. Joseph and follow his example of never complaining and accepting all as part of divine providence. St. Joseph's life was not one of ease, but one of work and suffering. Just as Christ's life began with suffering, so too would Jesus share that suffering with his dear mother and foster father. Blessed Peter Julian Emmard says, from the day in which Simeon had predicted Christ's passion, that passion was often present to the mind of St. Joseph. The scriptures showed it to him in figure while Jesus spoke to him of it often. God would ask for blind obedience from St. Joseph. St. Joseph willingly complied and never questioned God. He let himself be led by the spirit of faith and obedience. We, on the other hand, find it so difficult to blindly obey God when asked to do so. We question as to why things couldn't be otherwise and add that the alternative makes so much more sense. The eternal why is often on our lips. We often fail to see that the things which we feel our mere circumstances governing our actions and molding in our, our life, but they are in reality the providence of God. St. Joseph beautifully models for us both total submission and obedience to God, even when his will contradicted his plans. He put aside any idea of his own, any which would result from his foresight or personal inclinations, and blindly obeyed the almost hidden will of God. St. Joseph followed exactly, without delay, every indication of the divine will. And if it were not manifested, he would remain in a loving state of waiting and in the meantime, do all that prudence suggested to him. He was a responsive instrument who perfectly accomplished God's will in all things. The essential sanctity of St. Joseph lies in his quick and unquestioning obedience to God. My dearly beloved in Christ, many people rebel if they have in their mind a clear perception of what they are to do. And then they're shown God's will which, which contradicts their plans. This is what St. Joseph had to do when God told him to leave Nazareth. Go to Bethlehem, then to Egypt, then back to Nazareth. All difficult journeys. Unlike ourselves, St. Joseph displayed no pride, no rebellion, no questioning. He displayed only faith in God's providence and unquestioning obedience. It was enough for him that God wanted a thing to be done. St. Joseph did it and never complained. My dearly beloved in Christ, St. Joseph also displayed a great deal of courage and self-sacrifice in following God's will. When the ancient told him, in the middle of the night, to take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt, St. Joseph courageously directed the Holy Family to travel to that pagan, idolatrous country. Trusting in divine providence, he bravely faced the troubles and hardships of the long journey. Perhaps the greatest sorrow for St. Joseph was the fact that he had to accept death before Christ would begin his public ministry. Blessed Peter Julian Emmard says, Whenever our Lord went up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Pasch or Pentecost, he would beckon to St. Joseph, Come, Father, come and see where I shall be crucified. Or take him to Gethsemane and say, This is where I shall spend three hours in agony, sweating blood and water for the sins of the world. Falling at Jesus' feet, St. Joseph would weep and exclaim, My dear child, allow me to remain on earth to suffer and die instead of you. Further, St. Joseph foresaw Mary's tears and misery. He would have desired to stay by her side, and he must have begged Jesus to be allowed to remain on earth 
that he might climb Calvary and sustain his holy spouse. Poor St. Joseph. He had to submit to death and leave behind him Jesus to be crucified and abandoned by his people, Our Lady to suffer alone, unassisted. Nevertheless, since such was the will of God, he humbly accepted it. St. Joseph's acceptance of death crowned his hidden life of virtue, for he died peacefully in the arms of Jesus and Mary. My dearly beloved in Christ, St. Joseph is a powerful intercessor for us. St. Thomas Aquinas says, There are many saints to whom God has given the power to assist us in the necessities of life, but the power given to St. Joseph is unlimited. It extends to all our needs, and all those who invoke him with confidence are sure to be heard. God has given special power to help souls preserve chastity and to conquer temptations against holy purity. I strongly recommend that you daily recite the prayer to St. Joseph enclosed in today's bulletin. Those who place themselves under his protection and daily implore his aid will receive great favors and will not easily fall into sin. The following story shows how anxious St. Joseph is to be invoked and to assist us in time of temptation. One night, a young Carmelite brother who from his youth had preserved the angelic virtue of chastity, was, by God's permission, violently tormented with temptations against this delicate virtue. By the grace of God, he finally emerged victorious from the combat. The next day, he was sent on an errand to the city by his superior. On the way, he met a venerable man who addressed him, Brother, why did you not have recourse to St. Joseph last night in your fierce struggle with temptation? Filled with confusion by the consciousness that the inmost secrets of his heart were known to this venerable man, the religious tried to reply, but the stranger had vanished. The brother realized that it had been none other than St. Joseph himself who appeared to him. My dearly beloved in Christ, when tempted, recite the prayer, Jesus, Mary, Joseph, repeatedly, and you will not fall. Surely we're safe in St. Joseph's hands. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.